Hey there everyone, this is the first video in a series I'm going to be doing on James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake, all of which is going to consist of short videos explicating certain passages which are accessible from the perspective of the meaning present in them, they're very prominent in terms of some of the themes in Finnegan's Wake, and they're also just enjoyable from a sonorous and a stylistic perspective. So this is going to serve someone who maybe needs something to go along with Finnegan's Wake, in addition to, you know, maybe an annotated guide or something like that, that's going to help make sense of some of the passages when it comes to plot, but mostly themes, because Finnegan's Wake is a lot of things, but one of the things that I don't really think it is, is plot focused. That's not really what the novel is about. It's much more concerned with archetypes, very broad themes, and playing with language. So in this lecture, I'm just going to be doing an introduction to what Finnegan's Wake is, some of the basic ideas about what we think the content of the book is when it comes to the plot, some of the themes, ideas for understanding how to read it, and then in the future videos, they will all be relatively short, and I'll have them all in a playlist that you can kind of go through, and the title of each of the videos will have the page and line number references so that you can hopefully scroll through them fairly easily and maybe find a passage that you're interested in or just see some of the ones that I find particularly compelling. James Joyce was an Irish writer writing in the early 20th century. His most famous work is Ulysses, which is considered the great 20th century novel. And Ulysses takes place on one day in Dublin, Ireland. And it follows Leopold Bloom and Stephen Dedalus as they go about their daily activities. And there's all sorts of interesting stuff going on in Ulysses. Fantastic book. You must read it before Finnegan's Wake, I think. At least if you want to understand Joyce, have some of the background of the kinds of things he's interested in so that you can kind of plant your feet. But Finnegan's Wake is basically a mirror image insofar as Ulysses takes place over one Dublin day. Finnegan's Wake takes place over one Dublin night. And specifically, it takes place in a dream. We're not really sure whose dream it is. That's kind of one of the great hermeneutic questions about Finnegan's Wake is whose dream is it? Is it more than one person's dream, maybe? You know, some sort of collective unconscious kind of thing. And themes such as Jung's and Freud's resound throughout the novel. So it's nice to know, you know, little stuff like that. But another of the thinkers that really figures into Finnegan's Wake is Giambattista Vico. He was an Italian philosopher who was really the first philosopher of history. And he basically had an idea of this recursive cycle that history is. First, we believe in gods. Then we believe in heroes. Then we believe in democracy. And then there's a short recurso, which is basically the um, the moment in the cycle where everything goes into chaos and we restart back from the bottom with gods, so to speak. And this is basically Vico's way of understanding how civilization comes about. And Joyce is really interested in this cyclical nature of history. That's one of the key themes of Finnegan's Wake. And another of the key themes of Finnegan's Wake is the fall and redemption of mankind both as a species and as individuals. And he's taking one of kind of the main inspirations from the song Finnegan's Wake. And it's very good to not only listen to the song, but memorize it because lots of the lyrics figure fairly prominently in the novel, especially in you know the first 30 pages is the first chapter of the first part is basically a summarization of that song kind of. It kind of follows that skeleton. But in the song Finnegan's Wake, we have a man named Tim Finnegan, and he gets drunk, climbs up a ladder, and he falls from the ladder and breaks his skull. So his friends send him on to a wake, a funeral for my American viewers who weren't aware of that term as I was. 
At this wake, in typical Irish fashion, there's a mix of the somber and serious and the playful and the joyous. So they're mourning and then they start partying and they start drinking in Irish fashion and some beer and other spirits start getting thrown around and some liquor spills over Tim Finnegan's dead body and he resurrects and he makes this funny comment basically saying, did you think I was dead? Go back to what you were doing. And Joyce was really interested in this because it kind of has this bridging effect of the high and the low, of the high of a resurrection, which is a central tenet of Christianity, with the low of alcohol and death. And he was very interested in this because Tim Finnegan is an ordinary guy, but he's an ordinary guy which resurrects, and he resurrects within the frivolities of the lives of society, in a sense, which is the friends around him that are engaged in you know, mourning, but also drinking and excitement and frivolity. So all of that for Joyce represented a latent potential within everyone. And this is something that he's taking from Friedrich Nietzsche, is the ability to sort of take life by the reins, so to speak, and both destroy certain values as well as affirm other ones, and specifically affirm the ability of the human will to create for itself. So he thought that a very important part of history that allows for the rising of mankind, just as the rising through these historical levels of Giambattista Vico, was the creative spirit. The ability to create new things, the ability to push boundaries, to be avant-garde. But nevertheless, he was no idealist. He recognized that, for example, the mythical hero of Odysseus in Homer's Odyssey is just that. He's an ideal hero. So when he writes Ulysses, Ulysses being the anglicized version of the name Odysseus, he basically uses the skeleton of the narrative of Homer's Odyssey, but makes it real, makes it apply to real people. And in the same way, in Finnegan's Wake, there is a realistic understanding that history doesn't just get better and better without end. There's always the inevitability of the fall into chaos. And the creative artist is always trying to, you know, straddle that fence, so to speak. And this is what Joyce was trying to do his whole life, battling criticism, battling terrible eye problems that made it such that when he had to write Finnegan's Wake, he would sit on the edge of his bed on his stomach with the page on the floor, and he would wear a white lab coat so that more light could be reflected onto the page, and he would write eventually by the end with big like crayons and colored pencils and stuff like that so that he could see it. So like any good artist, he was battling all of these ailments and all of these challenges which represent the frailty of any creative endeavor. And in Finnegan's Wake, by going into the dreams of a family, we understand a little bit about the subconscious of not only these particular individuals, but their archetypal significance. So the idea of Carl Jung's archetypes you know, things like the hero's journey that we hear so much about are very important in Finnegan's Wake. And we have a few characters. Probably our most important is Humphrey Chimpton Earwicker, or HCE, and Anna Livia Pluribel, or ALP. These two characters are married to one another and are male and female respectively. And Humphrey Chimpton Earwicker, his initials, just as ALPs, are sprawled throughout the novel. Sometimes they are Houth Castle and Environs. Sometimes they are Here Comes Everybody. But constantly his initials are getting recycled. Um, He is also represented in different personas as Tim Finnegan from Finnegan's Wake. Also Tim McCool, the famous Irish legendary mythical hero 
and he represents the average Joe, in a sense. This is actually what the term Finnegan means when Irish people use it, is it can mean, like, just when you say your average Dick and Jane, your average Finnegan, that's the meaning of that word. And it reveals to us a lot about the title. There's archetypal significance in the title. Because you will note that if you look up the song Finnegan's Wake, it is Finnegan apostrophe S wake. It is the wake of Finnegan. It is his funeral. But the title of Joyce's work does not have an apostrophe S. It is Finnegan's wake. So it's almost a declarative statement that Finnegan's do in fact wake up telling us that this is only a dream and there is a, a life that has more clarity beyond the obscurity of the text. Also, a, a provocation or a prophecy for the future, telling the Finnegans that read this book to wake up, to wake up to the profundity of the language you use, things like that. So Finnegan's wake has so much bred within an archetypic, archetypally that... HCE comes to represent this sort of phallic masculine energy. He is the, you know, the great creator in a sense. He's linked to, for example, the Abrahamic gods and whatnot. Gods, just because there's kind of different, you know, usages of what that term means depending on the Abrahamic religion. But then he's also linked to Buddha, and he's, you know, linked to Muhammad and all these other people. And then ALP, Anne Olivia Pluribel, represents the kind of balancing force, the yin to the yang of HCE, in that she has this feminine energy, which HCE will often be represented as an ocean, but ALP is a river. If we look at her name, Anna means river in Irish. Livy, the river Liffy. And then Pluribel, as in plural, right? She is multiple. She represents this explosive capacity and this life-affirming capacity. Just as rivers provide the foundations for society, you know, Mesopotamia and modern agriculture beginning between the Tigris and the Euphrates River, this always represents a fundament for the creative potential of humankind in history in a very real sense. She also represents, on the other hand, though, a destructive capacity, just as over time rivers will kind of dig into a landmass and cut through it, as is the case with the River Liffey bisecting Dublin. There is a destructive potential that accompanies every creation, and that's a very Nietzschean point of his that he wants to hold on to, is there's always a little bit of balance. And HCE and ALP balance each other in a certain sense. And in another balancing maneuver, we have two other characters, which are Shem and Sean. They are, there's all sorts of other names for them. They're Jem or Shem. They can be Cain and Abel. They can be all of these different brother figures. So they represent the strife inherent in every act of creation. Because, you know, ALP and HCE have come together, brought their forces together, and they've made children. But these children fight, like all brothers do. And this is, in a sense, autobiographical because this has some relations between Joyce and his brother Stanislaus, who kind of didn't always get along. In fact, Stanislaus was very critical of Finnegan's Wake, partly because Joyce was not very financially responsible or... Um, oftentimes would kind of relinquish his duties to his family and stuff like that in an effort to see an opera when his family's starving or whatever. So Stanislaus had some some righteous indignation, I would say. But these two brother figures figure throughout as the strife that goes along with every act of creation. And there's a sort of, of course, just like with any kid, there's a nurturing that 
is required behind that act of creation in order for it to go well. And then there's also Izzy, the daughter. And she kind of represents, in another autobiographical way, Joyce's own daughter. She has her own allure because Joyce's daughter was very beautiful and Izzy is in Finnegan's Wake. But there's also some tension within Izzy's character between her and HCE, which is explored throughout Finnegan's Wake. But the basic plot of Finnegan's Wake is that this family is sleeping and we're in their collective unconscious. And HCE has committed some kind of crime. We're not exactly sure what it is, but it appears to be sexually promiscuous in some regard. There are several theories as to what it is. I think the most plausible ones are that it is incest with Izzy, or that it is public masturbation, or that it's a mix of both. Maybe, you know, those could be done in the same span of time, I suppose. And wh why might it be incest? That sounds so weird. Well, if we look at HCE's name, Humphrey Chimpton Earwicker, Earwicker resembles, and when you read The Wake, you got to start making these kinds of connections in language. Earwicker resembles earwig, which is a type of insect. And insect is a sort of misspelling of incest. So there's all these sorts of Freudian ideas of, oh, the, you know, the unconscious kind of in dreams, it reveals itself, but in a sort of code that we have to figure out. And in Finnegan's Wake, Joyce reinvents language in a very powerful way. And I've done a lecture that you might want to look at regarding using the philosophy of Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari in order to understand the language of both Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake. And that might help understand a little bit. But he's writing, there, there's this common idea that he's not writing in English. But he is writing in English. But what he does is he shows the pregnancy of the beautiful English language. It really makes you appreciate the English language, unlike any other work. Because, you know, English is an amalgamation of German, Dutch, French, Italian, Spanish, you know, Latin, Greek, etc. And Joyce was a language master. He graduated with a bachelor's degree in English, Italian, and French. He was fluent in, gosh, like 20 or 30 languages, I believe. But there's at least 70 in Finnegan's Wake. So that's a lot. And there's lots of different puns that happen with all these different languages. And that's why it's helpful to have an annotated guide, which I'll be doing another lecture at a later time about secondary literature, about additions for Finnegan's Wake and all that if that will help, but that's not really pertinent here. But you just have to be aware that he is writing in English, but it's his own unique English. It takes heed of the etymology of words, of the way in which we actually use language and its subtleties. Oftentimes, it's inherent paradoxes. So he will constantly create compound words and just new words that are sort of misspellings, quote unquote, of a number of different words. But when you read Finnegan's Wake, you'll start to get a new idea of what the word misspelling even means. If you're lucky, it shouldn't mean anything anymore because a word is only misspelled if you presuppose a normative framework for how you ought to use language. And Joyce was trying to go against that. He was trying to create his own linguistic paradigm that is able to make puns on itself that refers to itself and that is pregnant with multiple meanings at the same time without making it clear. Just as the mind in a dream or just the unconscious in general doesn't make itself clear and is not exhaustible either, so too Finnegan's Wake is both unclear and inexhaustible. It is a constantly reifying process which adapts to the knowledge that you bring to it. And that makes it so exciting. If you're a math person, I am not, you will get some of the math jokes that he makes. 
if you're into Arthurian legends or romances, maybe you'll get some of the stuff he says about, you know, Britomart and Guinevere and Arthur and stuff like that. Maybe you're into Nietzsche, so you'll get some of the the kind of German philosophy references. All of this different stuff is pregnant in it, and way more than I would say almost anybody is going to have throughout their life in terms of knowledge. And it should be noted that it took Joyce 17 years to write Finnegan's Wake. It was constantly an evolving process of him learning new words and having an extensive revision process. But for Joyce, just like any act of creation, he saw every act of creation as tentative and evolving and thus constantly in need of reworking. So he would constantly, even after the manuscripts were sent off to the publisher, he would send a telegram telling them to alter such and such. And I'm pretty sure one time a French publisher, he he sent a telegram to them requesting a change for Ulysses, and they sent it back saying too late. Like, your book is already published. Sorry, we can't, we can't help you. So Joyce was a perfectionist, but in a way that can be appreciated when you read Finnegan's Wake. So that being said, I hope you'll enjoy this series of small little lectures. I will present the text on the page, and I'll be trying to strike a balance where I mention the references and the allusions and the pregnancy of the language being used, but without resorting to just listing off for example, translations of different words. I want this to be approachable and help you understand how you can look out for these sorts of passages, which are once again just orally and sonically fascinating and also archetypically and semantically significant. That being said, that's it for this lecture. Check out any of my others if you haven't. Also, you can become a channel member if you'd like for $5 a month and gain access to a monthly private philosophy Zoom. I also have super thanks available if you just want to donate to the channel because books are not cheap. That's it for this lecture, and I'll see you in another one.